What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome. You know what I was thinking about doing? I was thinking about doing a full fucking spin move with the chair when I did that, but I tried it in one of the videos and my chair just like hits it. So I was going to try to do like a full spin while keep them. Okay, never That's mind. That's like a I'm Leonard Fournette spin. Just halfway. <laughs> fucking slow motion. I'm probably quicker than Leonard Fournette on the B button. <laughs> Speaking of the B button, this is bunk bed break downs. That is Michael. That is Noah over there. This is big dogs dynasty show but since it is august since redraft leagues are heating up we are coming at you with redraft content we know the season long uh drafts are heating up because the season is happening you will have your fantasy drafts we're gonna kick off fantasy season is coming we don't know if it's gonna finish but it is absolutely gonna be here from the beginning so we want we at least want you to win your drafts if nothing else you get to talk shit about winning your drafts we don't know if you'll be there in the end today we're gonna talk about the best value picks in 2020 fantasy football. There is still a lot of value to be had. I, I, I'll be honest, I'm coming increasingly, um, what's a good word for hatred? I'm, I'm becoming in, increasingly- angry. Disgusted. Angry, disgusted. Repulsed. Repulsed by the word value that goes around in fantasy football because a lot of the times people just say, oh, this guy's such a good value, this guy's such a good value, but he still fucking stinks. So we're going <laughs> yeah. to give you picks- in which they're not just values. You don't want to just take them because they're dropping to you, but they're guys that you're, you're targeting at value, okay? So there's some guys you want to target ahead of the round. There's some guys that maybe you'll, you'll take them if they fall to you. But we're going we're gonna to look at the entire scheme, the entire board, and tell you what our favorite value picks right now in drafts are. And depending on like where you are in the draft, position by position, what you need for your team, this video will help you out. All right. Y'all ready? Yes, sir. No, 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 no. Hit that fucking intro. I don't know what that was. What the fuck was that? Like, y'all ready for this? <laughs> uh, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't quit your career in broadcasting if I was to go into the music was, like, industry well, anytime soon. Man. Over that. <laughs> yeah, like, no, it makes me look good or something. What the fuck do I pay you for? <laughs> yeah. Boys, boys, boys. All right. We're going to kick it off. And I want to put someone on here that's not some fucking mid-round, late-round value. Or uh, I wanted to put someone that's straight from the top because I think he still is upside. I think he still has value. And that is Austin Eckler, Noah's father. Okay, This man <laughs> is going to father the NFL just like he has fathered Noah in 2019. I mean, I don't really understand why people are fading him because like, Melvin Gordon just left, right? And on half – the season with Melvin Gordon, Austin Eckler finishes the top five running back. And his current price is the running back 13. So not even an RB1. In the, in the back part of the second round of your Superflex drafts is where you can land someone of Austin Eckler's caliber. And I think just get, uh, people are scared of like Joshua Kelly. Like Joshua Kelly is the quintessential jag. I tweeted this and people got big mad. I mean, if you, and then I think uh, Roto World today tweeted some shit about Joshua Kelly has the edge for the number two role. Uh, they deleted it later because they know I'm fucking onto their shit with my new account, uh, Roto, Roto Bait Exposed. Uh, but I took a That account's going to blow up. That account's going to get big soon. I took a picture of that account. I didn't let them get away with it. I don't sleep. I got them on fucking notifications, and I, I read into the actual thing, and what it actually says is rookie running back Joshua Kelly might have the edge for the number two role. He could be the better compliment to Austin Eckler, and it wouldn't be surprising if the Chargers go with a hot hand. So none of that tells me he has the second string for anything. This guy's a jag, okay? So if you're fading Austin Eckler because of jags, don't do it because he's got the receiving volume. This guy was the, in terms of yards throughout run, he was top five in the NFL, not just for running backs, top five in the NFL across wide receivers and tight ends at 2.74 yards throughout run, which is absolutely fucking ridiculous. They're going to pass him the ball. We saw what he looks like without Melvin Gordon. Like, I don't understand why we're fading him. In best ball, in the second round, if Austin Eckler is there, I've been drafting him every single time. What do you guys think about that for redraft? Do you guys like Austin Eckler? Are you guys fading him at the second round draft capital? Like, what are you saying? I'm in. If we're going with that, like, early running back strategy, you know, and he's the second round running back that falls to me, even if I'm at, like, the 110 and he's the 203 or the 204, yeah. Eckler's going to be the guy I'm smacking there every time. And people want to talk about, oh, like, his receiving numbers are going to come down. He's not going to get as many targets. Might be true, but then again, he is used as a weapon, right? Like, he even said it himself. He runs 35, 40% of his snaps out wide 
or in the slot. Like, this is a fact, people. We're not making this up. And he's been, like, since he came into the league, one of, if not the single most efficient running back in the NFL. Yards per touch last year, or 2018, number four in the NFL. Yards per touch in 2019, literally number one overall. Like, this is just what the guy does week in and week out. And when Melvin Gordon returned, like, he was still really good. And I want to read off a stat. Uh, Mel, uh, Austin Eckler had three rushing touchdowns last year, three on the entire year. From weeks one to four, he had all three of them. Melvin Gordon returns from weeks five through 17, <clears throat> literally had zero. Okay. So that's a role that Eckler gave up completely to Melvin Gordon. This year, are we expecting Justin Jackson, who's the same size as Austin Eckler, to take over the entire goal line work? Absolutely not. Like Eckler is going to be at worst. 40% of the goal line carries, 50% of the goal line carries. So that rushing touchdown number is going to be higher this year than it was last year. The receptions are going to be a floor part of his game. Maybe they're not up there with whatever he, he posted up last year because he had games where he caught like 12, 13 passes. But like, let's not think too much about the numbers here, guys. Like you're still getting a running back who is going to get 18 plus touches, who has been one of the most efficient running backs over the last three years and is a floor play of 75 to 80 catches this year. Yeah, you might not hit 100, but I'll take 80 as my RB2. So I, don't, I just think this is one of those where people are looking too far into the numbers and just look at the bigger picture here. What a way to start the show. We get some charges <laughs> love right off the rip. I never thought I'd see the day. Even in the rookie show. Don't get like, used to it. Do not get used to it. I'm not. I'm like really scavenging this list for Justin Herbert, like as a <laughs> value pick, even though that's not nothing to do with this video. As you guys were saying, like, you don't have to think too hard about it. He's just been one of the most, if not the most, efficient back in the NFL since he's been given a chance to produce. They bring in Trey Turner at right guard. They traded like Russell Kuhn from, who's like 50 years old. They bring in Brian Bulaga. Whoever's at quarterback this year, even if they're not going to throw to him a ton, they're both mobiles, which should help him, you know, open up bigger holes on the defensive side of the ball for him to run through. And we know he has a breakaway speed. We know he's a weapon on the outside or out of the backfield as a receiver. And I don't think it's brash to say he's like the second best receiving option on this team behind Keenan Allen. And what easier target is there to hit for a rookie quarterback or Tyrod Taylor than a guy two yards out of the backfield who has the potential to break a big play every other every time he touches the ball, basically. So RB 13 off the board. I'm not saying like pick him as a top five guy or a top eight guy, but just at that price, the value you can get out of somebody who is being picked as a high end RB two and likely going to produce for you as an RB one is a great value in the beginning of the third round. Yeah, that's what this episode is all about. Like, you're not, we're not targeting Austin Eckler as our like 202 pick overall because we think he'll finish as the RB3 overall. But it's just, it, it goes to show that the value is there. You shouldn't be fading this guy. You shouldn't be fading him. You're supposed to be taking him where he's going and you shouldn't be off of him because all these regression arguments. He's going to be there and he's going to hit the number that you're drafting him at and probably finish a little bit above that. And that's where you'll be happy to get return on him. Yeah, I mean, you know what his upside is. His upside is top five running back. Why? Because he's already fucking done. And you're getting him at an RB13 price. Even if he just returns that price, you're good. Because that's what you want. If you get those two running backs and they hit at a running back, a closer running back one price, like that's good for your team. Because then you can backfill with the wide receivers later. This mm -hmm. is like a classic case of like, someone's going to regress, so we're fading him. Like, dude, there's good players and there's bad players. The mean is made up with good players and bad players. The key to winning is picking out who those good players are. Austin Eckler, good at football, draft him. It's pretty much that simple. Uh, so we don't want to go too much more into it. But I, I want to say this. Jetpack Galileo on Twitter made a good tweet. And he said, you're subconsciously fading Austin Eckler because he went undrafted. And like that's, that's just like so true. Because if you look what happened with David Johnson, what happened to Alvin Kamara, very similar type of progression where they were like in a committee and absolutely dominated. Um, and now they have a lead role. Like if Austin Eckler was drafted, I just I don't think that we would be fading him like we are now, and like it just doesn't make any sense. Like I'm drafting Austin Eckler everywhere. I don't care if I have a hundred percent exposure in best ball. Yeah, okay, everyone. Maybe I, maybe I care a little bit. Maybe I care a little bit. I, I think that's still the right thing to do. I think uh, yeah. everyone. Yeah, everyone's just waiting for the shoe to drop on Eckler, and it's like, dog, he's been here for years. He ain't yeah. going anywhere. All right, like what yeah. are you waiting for to happen? <laughs> yeah, if you listen to Big Dogs last year, I remember Nick, you were you were touting Austin Eckler as like that fifth fifth round guy to target, and like I remember you targeted him in New York League, and that I don't like carry, everywhere, yeah, carry you to the playoffs. And look, Big Dogs told you to buy him last year low. We're telling him, we're telling you to buy high this year them. because keep buying, just fucking buy those good players, man. All right, next up, Justin Cut. Jackson. Oh, <laughs> bro, I've been hammering Justin Jackson's twelfth <laughs> round of every best ball so draft as well. Yeah, uh, just Great because value. I know Joshua, Joshua Kelly's not good. Uh, yeah. So he, he's like, he's fine. He's a, he's a nice injury candidate. But next up, someone we've talked about time and time again for the last two to three weeks is fucking J.K. Dobbins, man. Running back 30 at 81 overall. 
when you're drafting a running back three with the upside of J.K. Dobbins, like we broke down the numbers before, but it's as simple as this. Talent, check. Scheme fit, check. Offense, check. Opportunity is the only question mark. And at that price, when they're when the opportunity is like, you know, kind of up in the air, it's a little bit murky because no one knows who's really going to take the starting gig or who's going to like win out at the end of the season. I can totally see this guy being a great value and a league winner. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Jacob Dobbins has been my pick for a league winner for 2019. And I just think we're overthinking it a little bit too much with Mark Ingram, who has literally never had a workhorse role in his entire career. And I'm not expecting him to start at age 30. You're going to talk positive and I, I, I could probably throw some shade on it. All right. I'm going to say this is like almost a mirror image of what we saw at Miles Sanders last year, because I know Mike and I were a little bit lower than consensus on JK Dobbins coming out of college. And a lot of people felt the same way about Miles Sanders in 2019. And then you look at where he lands, you know, Miles Sanders landed in Philadelphia. He's obviously behind Jordan Howard for whatever reason. And he ended up being like the RB25 to RB30 per ADP heading into the year. We see J.K. Dobbins looking the same way, the RB30 currently. But you just look at the upside that he has and what Mike said, like Mark Ingram averaged 13 carries a game or something around that last year. And he was the RB8 on the season. J.K. Dobbins doesn't need 20 to 25 touches per game to end up being a running back one. And I'm not saying as the second fiddle guy to Mark Ingram, he's going to be an RB1. If something does happen to him, which is like kind of a shitty argument because it happens, you can say that about anybody. But I think even on a limited workload, like eight to 10 touches a game, he's going to be able to produce RB30 type of numbers. And if anything were to happen to Mark Ingram, there's really no better scheme fit and like, I guess, rookie position that J.K. Dobbins has put in because we saw him in college with athletic quarterbacks in his freshman and junior year be extremely efficient and then a dip in his sophomore year. And like, what better, what better match is there than Lamar Jackson in this Baltimore offense that we saw last year, Mark Ingram produced extremely heavily. And so we talked about him, I'm pretty sure, like each of the last four weeks on this show. So I think everybody knows <laughs> our feelings about him. Nick hasn't been on too many of them. So let's see the shade that he's about to throw on. Hit boy me with the Dobbins. shade, Nick. Let's uh, I just, I think, well, for one, I, I'll be drafting Dobbins in particular situations. Like I, I want a lot of these rookie running backs, but at the same time, I don't want all of them like on my team at the same oh, time. You know what I mean? Because like you yeah. said with the Miles Sanders argument, I don't see a, a real path to him being more than 10 touches within like the first six weeks probably. The reason Sanders was so valuable over the last half of the season last year, I mean, he put up basically 60 targets in almost like eight weeks, you know? And Dobbins is not going to get that. And the reports out of Baltimore are that, you know, Dobbins has looked good. Of course, we expect him to be good. Like, good players tend to look good, right? So, I'm not surprised about that. But I, I still think Ingram's just going to have that role where he's doing enough to, like, piss you off as a Dobbins owner. And he's just someone that you're never going to feel comfortable throwing into your flex spot. I just don't know if there's any valuable touches to be had for fantasy. Like, yeah. you, we're going to need, like, a lot of luck, a lot, something to really break right for J.K. Dobbins for him to get into that role. If I do miss out, like, J JT's getting to the point where I'm not going to draft him and redraft. DeAndre Swift I still absolutely love. And his ADP, like, still really hasn't corrected itself, like, past the early fifth round. So I'll still be getting tons of Swift. But if I do miss out on all those earlier rookie running backs, I definitely would start to target J.K. Dobbins at the end. I just think that – uh, there hasn't been enough for me to start moving up J.K. Dobbins in like I don't I don't have realistic hopes for him to make a, a really big impact in his first year other than like wishing the talent into a voluminous position. Yeah, yeah, dude. The, the first point you make is a good one. Like uh, you don't want to go in a draft and get like Cam Akers, DeAndre Swift, and J.K. Dobbins. You're, yeah, you're, you're gonna, you're gonna fun to have, but practicality yeah. wise, like yeah. it's not going to do you. Any you got to have balance. I totally agree with you there. So my thing with J.K. Dobbins is this: like we're wishing for luck, right? And luck is just like another way to say variance in my, in my eyes. Right. And, and in this season, in a COVID season, the variance is going to be high. So I'm not expecting JK Dobbins. to like just straight up win the job with Mark Ingram. Maybe he will. Uh, I think he's talented enough to do that, but I'm not going to bet on that. What I am betting on is like at that price of the eighth round, I'm betting on variance. And the fact that Mark Ingram could be taken out of the season at any point, like due to COVID. Or like Mark Ingram. Are you guys or, are you guys like assuming that J.K. Dobbins makes Gus Edwards completely redundant? Because I don't I don't I don't think I'm sold on that either. Yeah, I, I think he makes maybe Gus not Justice Hill, but Gus Edwards for sure. Yeah, I think he makes Gus Edwards pretty Just, redundant. Uh, Justice Hill died so that <laughs> so that I don't make fifty good terrible draft picks this year. <laughs> That's where Justice Hill was put on this earth. Um, 
Yeah, I, I just – I don't know. Like, I feel like Gus Edwards is somehow going to mix into, like, six carries a game that if they went to J.K. Dobbins, maybe he'd be up in that, like, 12 to 14 touch range. So, I'm a little bit more hesitant on Dobbins than you guys are. Yeah, no, it's totally fair. Uh, definitely a risk. I mean, if Dobbins is going in the same place as Swift with going, or if he's going in the same place as Akers oh, yeah. going, I'd be, I'd be way more hesitant. Yeah, and that's it's the thing. Just, like, uh, you could totally see him having the Miles Sanders thing at the end of the year, but you also can get him two rounds later than you were getting Miles Sanders last year. So the value is yeah. absolutely there because the upside is there. Yeah, exactly. But you got definitely, like, you brought up the risk, and that's totally fair. It's def- The risk is there, and I'm just I'm saying I'm recognizing that risk, but I'm recognizing the upside as well. So he's definitely an interesting pick. Um, next up, we got... Noah's boy, he's been standing from all, all off season. Zachary Moss. Um, <laughs> I'm kidding. We haven't been standing from pretty much the ball ball blast girls have been standing for him all off season. Um, but he is he is an interesting value mainly because Devin Singletary, in my opinion, is is not that good, especially in the passing game. So there's going to be some opportunity for Zach Moss there. And so far, the drum's been beating pretty strong on a training camp. He's going as the RB forty six at 126 overall and that is the most appealing part of this uh you know he's obviously a good a good football player he's not bad by any means um but i think at that price based on where he's going compared to where singletary is going which is more in like the mid single digit rounds like i'm gonna click the button on zach moss over singletary like 10 times out of 10 yeah i'm completely with you he's uh i was look i was pulling up my ownership percentages on underdog and uh (laughs) Anthony McFarlane is my number one owned running back. Really, really getting nervous about that. But right, right behind him, Austin Eckler is my number two most owned running back, 34% of my teams. Zach Moss is my number three at 27% because he's been going 12th, 11th round. And now you're starting to have to take him in like the eighth, ninth. And even at that, man, this is a Bills team that loves to run the ball. This is a Bills team that gives uh, an underrated number of goal line opportunities to their running backs. That's going to be Zach Moss's thing. And I, I think – people writing him off as just a plotter are reaching a little bit too far. I don't, I think athletically he's limited to that type of role, but he's produced like he, he's certainly capable of doing it all. Like he's had multiple seasons in college reception wise that were better than Devin Singletary's best receiving season in college. So we think of Devin Singletary as a small guy. And when you think of small, you just think of like really flashy, like good pass catchers. But in reality, Zach Moss was a much more prolific producer Uh, catching the ball in college so he could play that role if asked to so he might take half the receptions he might take the goal line work so I I feel like a lot of the valuable touch all all the sports center top 10 players are going to be Devin Singletary but all the valuable fantasy touches are going to go to Zach Moss and that's the way I'm looking at it for a four round discount Zach Moss could easily work himself into seven to eight rushing touchdowns this year and be like a, a pretty solid flex play yeah who would have thought I would put a running back over 220 pounds on a list of hyped players I hate fat running backs, but Zach Moss at his price is somebody I'm willing to buy in on. As you were talking about, this is a team that loves to give goal line rushes to running backs. I know Josh Allen stole like five of them last year, but you look what Frank Gore did, and they've been very adamant in saying Zach Moss is taking over Frank Gore's role. Frank Gore had 11 goal line carries last season, which was 12th in the NFL. He scored on just two of them. If you look at the average amount of goal line touchdowns scored for running backs ahead between eight and 13 goal line carries, it was 5.4 last season. So I'm not saying Zach Moss is guaranteed for for five or six goal line touches or goal line touchdowns off of the touches that Frank Gore would have had from last season. I'm just saying that Frank Gore was so poor in that department of the field that if Zach Moss were to perform that poorly, then he's probably just going to suck for you anyways. But I think if he is just an average talent and he gets those carries that Frank Gore commanded last season, and you know he had 179 touches on on the entire year, which is pretty astounding because you look at the r- amount of running backs and the list of running backs that had over 175 touches last season. Only five of them didn't top 1,000 yards from scrimmage, and they happened to be both Buffalo Bills running backs, Devin Singletary and Frank Gore, and then Latavius Murray, who's a backup, Royce Freeman, who's fat and sucks, and Melvin Gordon, who played a portion this season. So you look at Zach Moss, he has plenty of opportunity, whether it's going to be through the passing game, even though Josh Allen doesn't like to dump the ball off a lot because he likes to run like an idiot. Uh, He's going to (laughs) likely get a a few receptions in that department of the field. He's going to have volume on the ground, and he's likely going to be their goal line back for this offense. I mean, They sunk pretty decent draft capital into him, and they have a decent enough offensive line, and they seem to be building their team the right way from the outside in. So I just see as the RB46, maybe he's not a top 12 running back by the time the season ends, but I wouldn't be surprised if he outproduces Devin Singletary for fantasy this season. And the fact that you get him like four to five rounds later just, in my eyes, makes him a huge value. You know what's mad funny? Like... (laughs) We were talking about how some of the funnier comments on the bunk bed breakdowns videos are all always about like your hair or some shit. I always like will read through them and it'll always be like you guys calling someone fat or like a fucking <laughs> idiot. And it always makes me crack up. 
And then when I get on here and just hear Noah rant and be like, hey, this quarterback's a fat ass. This running back sucks. <laughs> this guy fucking stinks. He's an idiot. Um, so that just kind of popped into my head. But, yeah, dude, like, when you think about, like, the role that Frank Gore had last year and they're already telling you that Zach Moss is basically going to have that, like, you couldn't have – no one can be as bad as Frank Gore was <laughs> last year. So when I think watch of Zach Moss – Watch highlights. Actually, I don't think he has highlights to watch. <laughs> yeah, that's not, a, that's not an actual video on YouTube. Uh, but if he's going to get that volume and be – better than frank gore there there's a very real chance in his range of outcomes that they give him the hot hand for a week like it wouldn't surprise me whatsoever if we saw a few 20 touch games out of zach moss because if you're averaging 4.9 yards per carry in a game 5.5 yards per carry in a given game like why not just ride that hot hand and that was never in the range of outcomes of frank gore because he can't he wasn't capable of putting up 5.5 yards per carry and hands are ice cold man yeah ex exactly so it was like they 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 went out of their way to keep giving Frank Gore the ball where now it's like Zach Moss at this point of his career is better than Gore was last year. So they're not going to have to force it. They're just like, Oh, he's playing well. Yeah. Let's just keep him on the field. They're not going to have to take him off. So I think his weekly ceiling is a little bit higher than, uh, than I think people are giving him credit for too. No, I love that. I love that. I mean, I think, you know, we talk about hot hands and, and how that happens. And Frank Gore was literally like, it was ice cold. He's like, he's like that friend where you go to Vegas with them and you're playing craps and he just throws fucking craps. Back Get off my back. table. Yeah. Back to back. Go back to the room or yeah. something. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but like you, we no one wants to kick him off the table because he's like old or he's some hot chick or whatever. But in this case, <laughs> this case, that doesn't happen. So we can easily see him getting kicked off. And honestly, Devil Sing Devin Singletary from a receiving perspective, we've already seen what he's in the NFL. And he's like one of the worst, like, like, like bottom bottom 10 to 15 percentile from a efficiency perspective so it's about time they brought someone in you guys said you wouldn't be surprised if zach moss outscores devin singletary i think i would bet on zach moss outscoring devil singletary on a points per game basis by like mid-season at the latest so you know i think you put it really well he's not a sexy pick he might not get on all the highlights but uh, in terms of production and fancy points uh, he's gonna get the probably the high leverage touches which is what you want yeah. all right next up uh we don't tell handcuffs much because uh, i think handcuffs are pretty boring but I, like, I put this guy on here. I don't know how, what you guys think about him, but it's Tony Pollard. He's going at RB40 at the 118. So basically in round 10 when you're drafting, drafting backups anyway. And I just, I think that for him, like I would not draft him if I had Zeke, um, but I would draft him if I didn't have Zeke because we kind of saw a little bit flashes of him of what he did uh, when they gave him the role for very limited samples. And there was two games that happened last season where he basically came on and he had 14 touches and uh, 14 touches and he went for 22 points in one game and 21.8 points in another uh, so two out of four games he was basically giving you like top five RB performances I think you know they run behind a great O-line uh, they run with a great offense has a lot of scoring opportunities so he's like one of those dart throws in like the later rounds where in this season where there's COVID and you don't know what, what's going to happen even though Zeke's got it and people think he's immune that's not how the disease actually <laughs> works uh, so if Zeke misses time you're, you're really looking at high upside. There's only a couple handcuffs like that. You know, Alexander Madison is one and Tony Pollard is another. So in those late rounds, don't go like spending all your capital targeting other people's handcuffs. That's a waste. I usually just grab one or two per draft uh, just in case that hits. Cause if he hits, I think he, he can definitely help you win a few weeks down the line. My yeah. problem with him is like, he's not even the best Antonio from Memphis in the NFC East that plays <laughs> running back. Anymore. So, I mean, there's just, you have to hope that a lot goes right for Tony Pollard for him to produce. I guess you can hope on Zeke, like going to Cabo and catching disease again for him to be able to produce. But for me, like Zach Moss, we just brought up is going later. I think he has standalone value and upside. Whereas Tony Pollard, I know it's cliche, but there are a ton of mouths to feed already. I don't see how without an injury happening, he squeezes his way into any sort of valuable role. Definitely not. This is not a, this is not a, like, I think he's going to be playable with Zeke there. It's like, we talked about Zach Moss, like his range of outcomes is, is like this, right? Where he'll provide you some, some nice weekly floor flex. And on the upside, he can provide you maybe some like mid to high end RB2 or whatever. Uh, and then Tony Pollard's variance is like, you can't even see it, but it's like, it's like this where like his floor is like zero points. But if he hits in the case that, that Zeke actually does get hurt in a very unpredictable season, uh, I think he actually like can flirt with like top eight, top 10, like running back upside. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. But yeah. I agree with you. I'm going to probably go with Zach Moss more often than, than not on Tony Pollard. Yeah, I, I, I'm actually the opposite of you, Mike, where I won't own Tony Pollard anywhere unless I own Zeke. Like, this is a year where if I do draft a running back and I know who their pure handcuff is, I'm going to grab them. The way I look at it is, like, I want to grab the fewest amount of guys that, you know, you, you, you draft dudes and you know, like, okay, they're going to be, like, one of my first or second drops after the first couple of weeks if they don't produce. Yep. 
Tony Pollard's not that for you if you own Zeke. Like, he's actually a valuable asset to you, in my opinion, if you own Zeke. He's someone that you're holding on to because he's insurance. In a season-long – like, he's not anyone I would ever draft in best ball, but in a season-long league, like, you just really got to get into the playoffs. And that's an insurance policy on your first-round pick. And having your first-round pick in your lineup is massive because that's, like, 20% of the points you almost put up on a weekly basis. So, like, you have Zeke, he goes out, you have Tony Pollard. Like, you could probably – if it's a four-week injury, let's say, or something like that, like, Tony Pollard will probably be able to lift you to two wins, two and two by the time Zeke is back. So, I've kind of come around on the idea of drafting a handcuff as long as we know that that's like the next man up to get 80 to 85% of the volume. So with Tony Pollard, he's a guy that I'll draft if I have Zeke, but uh, if you don't own Zeke and you draft Tony Pollard and he gets five touches in the first two weeks, like he's the first guy you're going to drop, right? He's got really no value to you. Yeah. You could definitely, you could definitely make the argument to drop him. It depends on how deep the league is. If you're deep, if your league is shallow, I uh, probably don't want to waste too much resources. If you're like a 15 man roster or whatever, most of my redraft leagues, I play in like 18, 19, 19 rounds. Deep. We moved, so, uh, yeah, we moved our E-Town get down league to 20 this year. Yeah. And like a ton of IR spots. So like the, he, he, he'll be someone that maybe I'll target because I know if I use a spot on him, I still have an extra like four or five spots that I could probably get other guys that I like and won't be sitting on the waiver wire. So the bigger, yeah, the bigger lineups, obviously you, you get a lot more dart throws and dudes like that. Yeah, exactly. Um, next up, even cheaper than Tony Pollard, probably has some standalone value as well. Um, what'd you say? I said, speaking of IR spots. <laughs> oh, yeah, speaking <laughs> of IR spots. This is someone that I have not liked his entire career, uh, and it's Jarek McKinnon. But now he's going at 193 overall, so probably undrafted in some of your more shallow leagues at RB62 as the only, really the only relevant pass catching running back on that entire San Francisco 49ers offense, right? Uh, you know, we know, you know, Matt Breed is kind of gone. Uh, Raheem Mostert doesn't catch passes. Tevin Coleman just sucks. Uh, he stinks. So don't don't worry about Tevin Coleman. Like he's he's been he's been left by more undrafted free agents than anyone else in the NFL. So I think I think <laughs> yeah, it's we actually can, we, crazy. <laughs> yeah, we can actually we can actually kind of just fade him out. If you own Coleman, like or if you have him on your team, I would recommend you try and trade him as soon as he has this like quintessential like one week blow up. But Jerick McKinnon is interesting because it's a really muddy backfield. We don't know what's going to happen. He catches passes. The Kyle Shanahan offense, they run a crap load in San Francisco. So being part of a San Francisco running back committee is not the same as being part of a Washington Redskins committee because it's going to be – you'll get a slow up smaller percentage of the pie, but it's going to be a pretty big-ass pie. So I think, you know, given where he is, given how cheap it is, given he's the only one that actually has, like, receiving upside, he's someone where I'm very interested in, in redraft and even in Dynasty as well, just in those late rounds. Yeah, reports have been fucking glowing out of San Francisco, man. And you're just hearing it. You're hearing it every single day from, like, multiple beat reporters and the coaches and the players and shit like that. That's what you like to hear at this point. Like, it seems like the same thing kind of every summer. But last summer, he came into the offseason. They're like, oh, they had a setback, right, with the knee. He's trying to work through it. He's trying to get into rehab. And we know once they get on the field and this dude's already less than 100%, the re-injury risk is so high. But right now, he seems to be fully ready to go. All the reports are really good. And like you said, that backfield is always up in the air. And I was, again, looking at my ownership percentage. And McKinnon is there in like the 15th, 16th round of every best ball draft. He's like my sixth highest owned running back too. And I've taken a lot of shares of Coleman, but like McKinnon that late makes so much fucking sense because – it's it's like a, a coin flip on any of these guys to be the RB one in a given week, and McKinnon's got just as good of a chance because there's no loyalty, there's no fucking legions from Kyle Shanahan, man. He don't really give a fuck. And like you said, Tevin Coleman's been lapped by as many undrafted free agents as there might have been in the NFL over the last fucking five <laughs> years. So uh, McKinnon, I'm 100 percent on board with that call. Yeah, if there's one San Francisco running back that I'm going to invest in, it's going to be McKinnon just because I don't really have to invest in him. I'm just really nervous about sinking any sort of draft capital into anybody in this backfield because. I know Nick and I both loved Matt Burita last year. That perished real quick. A lot of people like Tevin Coleman. Fuck, people are popping off in this neighborhood. A lot of people like Tevin Coleman. Uh, that didn't really happen because, again, he's, he's sort of fat and he's not very good. Jarek McKinnon kind of, like, saved us, saved everybody from him being, like, the next David Johnson where he just isn't good at football, but people will hype him up because he can catch passes. And that's what really worries me about even investing in him at the price that he has is because He's in an offense that doesn't necessarily target the running back position a lot. I know Carlos Hyde that one year had like 90 targets, but uh, that's that's very far gone. And I don't think anybody on the San Francisco 49ers has seen more than like 40 targets out of the backfield other than like Kyle Juszczyk. Who's like, a who, yeah, so, who were their weapons during that year? I can't even – I couldn't even tell you. Probably like Kendrick Bourne and like Kendrick <laughs> Bourne again. Bro, it's been Kendrick Bourne season for the last five years in a row. <laughs> this dude's got to be like 32, no? Like how, how old is he? He's legit like 24 years old. What? He's just like, he's an old soul. Damn. Zam. I'll be quiet. <laughs> nah, that's, that's basically all I had. Like, 
Jarek McKinnon just isn't somebody that I'm super high on. Like, he, sure, he's extremely athletic, but he's never really been good at football. Like, fucking Matt Asiata was out touching him in Minnesota. <laughs> and I'm not sure that at this point of his career, after all his knees got torn apart 100 times over, he can run a 4-4 anymore. So uh, I guess the upside is there if you want to believe that he still has the athleticism. But for me, it's just not that it's a wasted pick because it's not really a pick you have to make, but I'm just not too excited about investing in him. Yeah, he's not, like, necessarily – I don't even know if I pick him for upside, but like he could do what Mostert did last year where give you like six explosive weeks in like an eight game span and then be like fucking dust or something. But at least he's maybe someone you could, re- if you, it's like, you're never going to know who you can rely on, but if you can ever grasp it for like a month or a two month period, it's worth the investment. And he's the cheapest one. That's kind of the way I look at it. I have some breaking news. Kendrick Bourne is 25 years old. So he's like almost 30, which is kind of crazy. He turned 25, like 20 days ago. Does he have 25 NFL receptions yet in his career? <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me check the stats. Let me hop into the lab. For he someone who I feel like hasn't caught a ball in the NFL, like <laughs> he's the Hall of Famer already. It doesn't make sense. It's like every he has nine touchdowns over the past two years. Really? Yeah. Wow, he does yeah. actually. 30, 30 yeah. receptions, 42 receptions. He went down in receptions last year, despite like Dante Pettis not being a thing. Like, <laughs> I don't understand in, though. people, bro. Why are so people so weird on Twitter? Like, what's wrong with people? <laughs> I feel like I feel like people on Twitter like spend an inordinate amount of time trying to hit on sleepers when really you should just be focusing on the top four rounds and not fucking busting there. Because yeah, if like if you don't bust in the top four rounds, you're golden. Like, like people are gonna go nuts if like Kendrick Bourne puts up like one twelve point this year. They're gonna be like, yeah, it's like I fucking called it. I'm like, right, like, shut, 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 shut your mouth. All right, all right, let's go, let's run it. All right, that's. I think that wraps up the running backs. Next, we're gonna move into the wide receivers. And first up, it's gonna be my man, Jules Julian Edelman, currently going at 90, 99th at wide receiver thirty three overall. I mean, this is this is a weird one because like you know. As a Patriots fan, first year without Tom Brady. So we don't know what that offense is going to look like. But what we do know is, you know, Nikhil Harry is still struggling in camp. Uh, They've got lots of young wide receivers. So normally what that happens is you're going to lean on your vets. And I think Julian Edelman is still going to get peppered with a lot of targets, uh, whether it's from Cam, uh, who I think is going to be. Like people still think Jared Stidham is going to start for some reason. I I don't know why. Uh, but that's like a thing out there. But I think it's going to be Cam. Yo, people and- really were buying into like, <laughs> we're going to do a dual fucking quarterback thing here. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, right. I, I, look, I think it's going to be Cam. And if you look at like who he relied on, like it's going to be the short to intermediate because Cam's deep ball kind of stinks. Uh, <laughs> like he's got an arm, but he's not very accurate. So I, in terms of like the short area of the field, like that's where Julian Edelman really, really operates. And I think at wide receiver 33, especially in PPR formats, He's someone that can kind of give you that wide receiver two uh, weekly upside. So uh, I like this pick. I, we get it. He's old. He's 33. So he's basically 40. Um, but, you know, as we've seen, like the guys that do tend to produce into the older ages are the ones that have done it before. And, and Julian Edelman has certainly at least done that. Yeah, for me, it's just like intuitive. You got to think about the situation. The Patriots don't have much of a run game. Like when you're hyping up Damian Harris as an elite running back in camp, you don't have a running game. Their (laughs) offensive line isn't great. Their defense, we've seen whether it's the Jacksonville Jaguars or the Chicago Bears, year after year, they tend to regress after having historical seasons. And on top of that, Donta Hightower and Patrick Chung opted out. So they have no real options outside of James White and Julian Edelman. And throughout his entire career, Cam Newton, look who he's peppered. It's been Greg Olson. It's been Christian McCaffrey. For one year, it was like Devin Funches, and we all know that I can't run very far down the field without passing out. And Kelvin Benjamin, too, another very fat wide receiver. So uh, we look at just the skill set that Julian Edelman has and the fact that he's produced year after year. He's never finished outside of the wide receiver 21 on a point-per-game basis since 2014. So basically half of a decade, this guy has been a wide receiver, too, for you. I honestly don't see how that comes to an end this year with them having little to no other people commanding targets in this offense. And just looking at another player that's being drafted well ahead of him, and it pains me to say this, but, like, what's the real difference between Julian Edelman and Keenan Allen this season? Like, they both have quarterback situations that are up in the air. They're both target hogs, and neither one of them scores a whole bunch of touchdowns. So I think at the value you can get him a few rounds later than Keenan Allen, I feel a lot more comfortable just taking Julian Edelman. I felt good to hear out of your mouth. (laughs) I felt felt real fucking good. Dude, Julian Edelman, I mean, you brought it up, like, he's one of the only constants on that offense going into this new season where if their system's anything like it was last year, Julian Edelman, there was only three dudes that had more targets than him in the entire NFL last year. It was Mike Thomas, 
Julio Jones and Allen Robinson. Then it was Julian Edelman. Like, that's what he's done year over year over year. Like, he's consistently an 1,100-yard receiver on a, on a per-game basis. 1,100 yards last year. Well, 1,100 year. yards on a per-game, man. That's fucking huge. No, no, no. Like, on a per-game basis, <laughs> his numbers always add up to 1,100-yard <laughs> season. I've got my fucking TI-83 calculator, so don't come at me right now, motherfucker. Yeah, no. Julian Edelman, I feel like I don't understand why he's going so low. He's just someone that – you're not going to love picking, but like as your second, he's only, he's going to be like a bench player for you. And you're going to feel fine about throwing him into your lineup and probably using him more often than not. You'll probably like him more than the guys that you're going to end up drafting ahead of him. Again, just someone that uh, is, is one of the only pieces of this new England offense is going to have a lot of turnover this year. Like Bill, Bill likes the constants. Bill likes the parts of the systems that he knows. And that's why Julian Edelman has been getting targeted so heavily for so long. And uh, I think Cam and Julian Edelman are going to have a really good chemistry there. For sure. Uh, yeah, dude, I, I, I love Jules, man. That's one of my favorite players of all time. So looking forward to what him and Cam get mixed up together in. But next up, another slot receiver, someone who we've pumped up a lot for Dynasty, but also for redraft, I feel like he's, he's going at a very good value. And that's Tyler Boyd, currently going at 95th overall as a wide receiver 32. So one slot ahead of Jules Nettleman. So a couple of guys you can get in that range that are, that are true values. And, you know, when it comes down to it, like the numbers are good, right? I mean, the guys has a great – collegiate profile he came in the nfl proved himself out back-to-back years had monster target volume which obviously we don't think that's going to continue going forward but um i what i do think is his efficiency will probably take a step up because last year the Bengals team fucking stinked and like i hated watching them but fucking this year stink <laughs> they got they got joe Punk. burrow they got Joe Burrow coming in. Uh, we saw what Joe Burrow did with Justin Jefferson. Tyler Boyd is going to play that slot role for Joe Burrow. And as a young rookie uh, quarterback, you're going to look for the easier completions. And those typically come out of the slot. And if you think about it, right, like A.J. Green, we know he's not going to be there long term, right? Joe Burrow is going to be looking to establish a connection with the future of that team. And who is the future? It's Tyler Boyd. Uh, it's T. Higgins, who will probably see less volume with A.J. Green there. But I think like he's really going to be looking for that connection and he's going to be looking for comfort. And that O-line freaking is trash still, even though they added some pieces. So he's going to be looking to get the ball out quick. And I think honestly, like Tyler Boyd is going to be one of his first looks more often than not. So the target's going to be there. I think the price is going to be there. Like he's in for another one K season. You can pretty much lock it up. And I think at these prices, like I'm definitely all in on Tyler Boyd. Dude, I don't think we've seen the ceiling of Tyler Boyd yet. Someone, someone tweeted out a, Uh, a good like we've heard the discussions like who could be this year's Chris Godwin and people are like Calvin Ridley DJ Chark I'm like what if what if Boyd pops off for like 1300 yards 1400 yards this year that wouldn't really surprise me you want to talk about like Burrow trying to uh, establish rapport with a wide receiver AJ Green's been out the hamstring injury T Higgins has missed all of camp with a hamstring injury John Ross left camp because his uh, his son and his wife have COVID they don't have a tight end there like who is he throwing the ball to right now besides uh, Tyler Boyd and Auden Tate, who's not going to be on the field when the other starters return. So right now, he's literally only establishing this rapport with Tyler Boyd. And like you said, like what he did last year, targeting the slot, and we'll throw this chart up on the screen, but almost every statistical category, Burrow was far above average in terms of his own relative stats uh, when it comes to throwing to the slot. 54% of his air yards went to the slot last year, went to receivers out of the slot, which is crazy considering they're usually running the, the, the shallower routes. He had 60% of his touchdowns went to slot receivers. His touchdown rate went up by 2.5% when targeting slot wide receivers. And Boyd is like an 80% slot guy when Green is on the field. He'll struggle a little bit when he goes outside, but if Green can get back onto the field, Boyd becomes an 80% slot guy. He's going to be Burrow's uh, number one target this year. So, yes, the targets might come down, but I don't think they're going to come down as much as people might make it out to be. It's one of those like arguments where, like, oh, there's just like a lot of competition for targets there but when you break it down into like real context and everyone's just been out of camp for so long like maybe there's not that much competition I think Boyd uh, is probably the best bet to finish the year number one amongst the the Bengals receivers in targets receptions fantasy points maybe not touchdowns but almost every other category yeah and you look at the root of his inefficiencies who are the quarterbacks he's played with over the past two years during his breakout seasons He's had the luxury of catching passes from Andy Dalton and Jeff Driscoll and then Andy Dalton and then Ryan Finley and then Andy Dalton again. Like they could not figure out which redheaded quarterback to put behind center these past two years. Now they draft another one with the number one overall pick who is one of the most accurate quarterbacks in all of college football history, even when playing in the SEC and dominated every single competition he played. Nick brought up the fact that he was elite when targeting the slot with Justin Jefferson. Obviously, Justin Jefferson is an elite talent, has really good athleticism, as we saw at the combine. But Tyler Boyd is definitely no slouch. His profile coming into the league 
was as pristine as it gets outside of athleticism. But at this point, like four to five years into the NFL, putting up back-to-back 1,000-yard seasons, I don't even care about the profile anymore. We know he's a good receiver. We know he's in a position to succeed because he's with Zachary Taylor, who loved to target Cooper Cup during his time in the Rams, and he loved to target Tyler Boyd last year at that big slot for an easy completion for the quarterback, despite the quarterbacks not being able to make easy completions because they suck. So you guys make a bunch of great points. He's the only guy in this offense that's been able to stick around throughout training camp and throughout the preseason. And he seems to be building rapport with Joe Burrow. And that's all you really want out of a slot receiver is heavy target volume. And if that comes and he sees the same amount of targets as he saw last year, and there's just a slight uptick in efficiency, he's going to be a fringy wide receiver one. And that sounds crazy, but you look where he finished these past two years, like wide receiver 21 and wide receiver 16. And I was drafted as a wide receiver 32 in a better situation. The ADP just doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, I mean, it's it, uh, the, the player profiler comp for him is Adam Thielen. I think that's actually like a pretty good one. I've always thought of him as like a Robert Woods type type deal. Um, all guys that just like aren't really lethal in the red zone, but are going to get a ton of targets and, and be efficient enough. So definitely, you know, if you wait on wide receiver, and the reason why we tell you to wait on wide receiver is because there's guys like this available in the late round. So cop a couple of them to play that wide receiver two, wide receiver three, sometimes even wide receiver four role for you, and you're going to be golden. And we'll close up the wide receivers with one more pick, and and it's Golden Tate. And oh, you had you had like the you just set yourself up for the segue and then fucking blocked yourself. <laughs> like pick yeah. a few of these guys, it'll be golden, and now we'll switch over to another wide receiver that I like, Golden Tate. <laughs> <laughs> fucking didn't mix the golden with the golden. I'm pissed. I'm upset. Right, no, you got you got to edit and save me on that one. Like, <laughs> yeah, no chance, Mike. The They're gonna see your flaws like they see mine. <laughs> uh, but yeah, look, I, I love Golden Tate. Currently, only has wide receiver sixty. Wide receiver 60 at 177 overall. So basically, you can probably grab him with like your last round pick in your redraft leagues. And if you look at what Golden Tate did last year, I mean, when he returned, he was the dude. And understandably, I think people are falling in love with the new toy in Darius Slayton because the guy caught a shitload of touchdowns and had a couple of monster games. But if we look at like target volume, Golden Tate is the guy. Here's his targets when he came back, right? Six targets, nine targets, 11 targets, 10 targets. Six targets, eight targets, seven targets, five targets, four targets, 11 targets, eight targets. He only had lower than six, uh, lower than five targets one time. And he had double digit targets three to three games. So in terms of volume, like if you're looking at PPR leagues, like Golden Tate is the guy. And the reason why is because young guys like to rely on people who are reliable. And Darius Slayton is, is a, as fancy and as flashy as, he's, as he is. He's, in my opinion, he's going to be the fifth option on that team. And I think the top option is going to be a mix between Golden Tate and Evan Ingram, and then it's going to be Staquan Barkley, and then probably Sterling Shepard, and then uh, uh, and then your guy Darius Slayton. But I think at these prices, like he's still got juice in the tank, and this guy's one of the biggest yak monsters since you know ever since he's been in the league. He he runs like a running back once he gets the ball. So I think in terms of uh, trying to get that flex play on the wide receiver, he's someone that I'm going to be targeting in that Giants offense all season. Let me ask you, Mike. Uh, if I know you're a Shepard guy, if if uh, if ADPs were thrown out the door and you're just looking at Shepard, Slayton, and Golden Tate, and you had to take one of them, you'd take Shepard, right? No, no, I would, I would take Tate. You'd I didn't take even one. realize. Yeah, yeah, I would. I didn't even realize that Tate was going this cheap. I like Shepard too. I like Shepard and Tate. I prefer them both. To, would you? Uh, would you roster both of them, even if if you got them both at good values? I almost feel yeah. like it's. I don't yeah, know I if I do both that. Them. That's so hard to. Them. Like, when when are you ever going to be able to know when to start one of them? Uh, whenever they play the Washington Redskins <laughs> <laughs> or the Philadelphia Eagles yeah, or the Philadelphia Eagles. True. Fair enough. Um, yeah. It just depends on how many wide receivers you're starting. If you're in a league that's like starting three wide receivers and like no flex, like probably not, but most of my leagues like two to three flex. So I could see myself uh, stacking a couple of wide receivers with Daniel Jones, who's another late round target um, in those situations. Yeah. And another underrated part about golden Tate is like, it was his first year on a brand new team being suspended or whatever happened for the first four or five weeks. And he's still produced. He's on pace for 124 targets. We rarely ever see NFL wide receivers go team to team and keep up a same level, a similar level of production that they're used to. His pace was 71 receptions, 983 yards and nine touchdowns last season, which is almost a carbon copy of what he did every single year in Detroit sands the receptions because he's always catching like 100 balls for 800 yards because he's Jarvis Landry of the North but you look at his per game numbers last year in eight out of 11 games he had either 80 yards or a touchdown and because of that put up double digit fantasy points in eight out of those 11 games so he's not even just a floor play he has a decent enough ceiling because as Mike was saying he's a really good yards after the catch type of receiver that can break big plays despite being a little bit older and being picked as a legitimate wide receiver five despite last year being the wide receiver 26 on a point per game basis 
and him not showing any signs of slowing down to this point of his career and basically every other weapon around him having a troubled injury history or just being new to the offense. I guess Darius Slayton can take steps forward this year, but we've never seen Evan Ingram play a full season. And Sterling Shepard has more concussions than I can count on one hand. Like, if you were ever going to bet any wide receiver producing because another weapon on that team got hurt in the receiving game, it's got to be Golden Tate because basically everybody on this team that catches passes gets hurt. And we saw last year, I'll put the splits on the screen, with and without Evan Ingram and with and without Sterling Shepard, I don't have the numbers in front of me right now, but it was basically like 17 points a game when either one of them wasn't on the field, which is legitimate wide receiver one number. So I'm not saying draft him in hopes that the other guys get injured. I'm saying even if they're not, even if they're on the field, he's going to produce. And if they're not, which seems pretty likely based on their history, he's going to way return way more value than what you sunk into him in the draft. Cool. Um, next, that kind of wraps up the wide receivers for us. There's a couple more here. And first up, uh, I put one of my favorite tight ends, my favorite late round tight end target in redraft leagues, and it's, it's TJ Hawkinson. And, you know, TJ Hawkinson, someone that I've, I've loved even coming out of college. And obviously he had a lot of got hit with the injury bug last year. And there's still some reports about his ankle, like not being 100 um, percent. So there was a one report that said, hey, like it's not 100 percent. And then the following report came out that said, like, hey, he's actually out there running routes looking fine. I'm sure he's not 100 percent. Um, but for me, like if he's actually going to be on the field, I'll take, I'll take like 80 to 90% of TJ Hawkinson over, over a lot of those late round targets in that, in that, uh, range. Like I prefer him over Gasicki easily. I prefer him over John U. Smith. Um, and I prefer him over like Goddard because I think in that Lions offense, there's enough of a pie from the passing volume perspective with a healthy Stafford to actually make him, uh, give him the necessary targets to actually provide that top five six upside so if you faded tight end early on and you miss on guys like Kittle and um, Travis Kelsey uh, I highly recommend like going after TJ Hawkinson I don't know what your thoughts are Nick I know you're pretty wary about like the injury uh, side of things um, but what, what are you thinking about when it comes to uh, TJ Hawkinson so like usually the way I work off injuries in the preseason is that I'm, I'm definitely on the pessimistic side but I use I usually preface like if, if someone has an injury now and they're on the practice field practicing like someone pulls a hamstring right and they're like oh week to week but they get back on the practice field and are on the field for like three straight practices running full I'm like okay that's clearly behind them the report was weird like it came out and it's like Hawkinson said he was like less than 100 percent then some people were like no it was just like mentally he's working back to 100 percent but literally everything since that report has just been people going nuts about TJ Hawkinson at training camp and how good he's looked and how physical he's looked and it doesn't look like he's holding back uh, prior to that report, like if that report never came out about his foot being less than 100%, he would be my number one, like, double digit target for every league I have this year, because we're going to look back and be like, oh, the case was so obvious for why TJ Hawkinson blew up this year, right? The early capital, the good offense, the good quarterback, red zone threat, whatever, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it, it's not... I'm a little bit more hesitant to where I would have probably targeted him in, like, basically every single league. I might fade a little bit because... You know, if a month in we're like, oh, the, the foot or the ankle is kind of sprawling up a little bit again, we're going to be like, oh, well, we kind of fucking knew that going into the year <laughs> was less than 100%. So just based on the injury reports. Um, but if we keep hearing positive reports for like two straight weeks in a row, I'm just going to be like, okay, it seems like a non, non-issue non and I'll draft Hawkinson. Yeah, I think we talked about him last week, Mike, or maybe two weeks ago about TJ Hawkinson versus Jared Cook. Basically, any tight end after tight end seven means absolutely nothing to me. Like there were weeks last year I put in fucking Ross Dwelly and he caught me two touchdowns and like had 14 <laughs> yards on the week. So when you're investing at this price, you just want somebody that is going to have high upside because if they don't hit, it doesn't really matter because you're not sinking a lot of draft capital into them. You just scream after that. TJ Hawkinson definitely has the talent. He was picked, what, like eighth overall ahead of Noah Fant, who they played at the same college. He outproduced Noah Fant in college. He's obviously very talented. He has the requisite athleticism that we've seen many tight ends with that type of athleticism produce in the NFL. I mean, he just checks all the boxes except for production, but you can't really re- expect a rookie tight end to produce year one in the league, especially when he was dealing with injuries throughout the season. Uh, his quarterback play wasn't very sustainable, and Matt Stafford's back was getting blown out like Lisa Ann. So uh, there wasn't much going for him as a rookie. And one positive note, I guess, is week one against the Arizona Cardinals. He absolutely blew up, but I guess everybody did against the Cardinals. But the last week he played of the season, he had 11 targets. So he's obviously somebody that, if you just take draft capital aside, like they obviously want to get him involved in this offense because they do believe he's a very good receiver and he should be a big part of the Detroit Lions going forward. So a tight end 13 off the board at basically a free price in terms of where tight ends are going. 
I'm perfectly fine investing in him because I do think he has the upside of a top five guy in the league. Yeah, I'll, and we'll throw up the I'll put out a tweet like last week, just showing like what the point distribution is. If you're like a tight end one to five over the last, uh, I guess since 2012, you average 14.8 points uh, per game. Tight end seven and 12 average 10.8. Like that, that is literally the definition of replacement streamer. So if you miss on a tight end, late tight end, you just drop them in the stream and redraft. That's how it is. But if you hit, it's a huge advantage, and you really want guys that have the top five upside. And for me, I think T.J. Hawkins has that if he's healthy. So like Nick said, we got to keep monitoring those training camp reports closely to see how, how active he is and if he's participating, but if he's participating come season opener, like I'm, I'm comfortable slotting teacher Hawkinson in there. And then the last guy we'll talk about is probably my number one tweeted about player over the last three months. It's uh, Ryan Tannehill. And for those of you guys that are playing in single round QBs, he's a great target in super flex. He's even better, but he's going as a QB 20 at 78 overall in super flex. And I believe he's going in the 12th round in single QB leagues. And I think everything for the perfect storm for that high upside quarterback, like really comes into play for Ryan Tannehill. He plays in a good offense. That's probably going to score a lot. They have a really, really cakewalk schedule. Um, one of the top easiest schedules in the NFL for sharp football. And, you know, I brought up a stat before uh, by David Zach, and I'm going to mention it again, but teams that pass below 500 attempts on average regress towards the mean and pass about 30, 63 more attempts the following season. So I'm really expecting an uptick in the volume, uh, the passing volume for the Titans offense to kind of offset some of the some of the efficiency regression that we see from the Titans because they obviously scored at a ridiculous pace. I think they scored on 31 or 32 trips to the end zone, which is absolutely unheard of in the history of the NFL. So you know they're going to come back there, but I'm really expecting an uptick on the volume volume on the passing side also on the rushing floor and you know he's kind of a you know you hate to use the cliche terms but he's he's a sneaky speedy guy and it's not because he's white it's because he played wide receiver lunch pail kid college. first and last out coach's son <laughs> yeah exactly exactly so he, he's my pick i he might be my top uh top exposure in terms of like players on my teams across all of my dynasty leagues and in redraft leagues i'm just gonna hammer him and in best ball leagues especially i've been hammering him and i think he's just a, a great great pick where he has like great floor, but also pretty high ceiling to kind of, you know, flirt with that top five QB upside. I think yeah, people, I, I think people are just not bought into Tannehill. They're just like, not sure if he's actually a good quarterback. And that's what happens when you play for Adam Gase for four or five years. I think he proved enough last year that like at worst, he's a good game manager. And like, mm -hmm. if that's the floor where you're getting him at quarterback 15 or quarterback 18 or 20, like, that's fine. But I think he also, like you said, has the upside that he showed us plenty of times last year. They're going to pass the ball a lot more this year. Love A.J. AJ Brown coming into his second year. Hopefully, Jonu Smith develops. But, like, he also did it last year without a second receiving option. So, they can kind of have Derrick Henry uh, carry the load for the team and be extremely efficient again in the passing game. Are you fading Henry again this year, Noah? Is that what that's? <laughs> I thought you were going to say something about him in the passing game. I was, I was getting a little nervous for you. No, I would never, I would never do that. I can't believe you <laughs> thought that was about to come out of my mouth, but no, if they, if they could have Henry be extremely efficient on the ground, that's going to open a lot of things up obviously for the passing game to be efficient again. So you're like, yeah, you know what? The efficiency is going to come down passing wise, but if defenses have to play every side of the ball, every angle, when you have a guy like Henry, like there's a good chance the efficiency is still going to be far above average. So I like the Tannehill call. I like the athleticism there. The only thing I would be nervous about is just the fact that like we don't have a really concrete second uh, option there that's proven behind AJ Brown. Yeah. yeah, that worries me a little bit too. But you just look at what Ryan Tannehill has done, even over the past three years, the steady improvement he's had in the touchdown department in terms of touchdown percentage, 2016, 4.9%, uh, which is pretty shitty. 2018, he missed 2017 with an injury. 2018, 11 games, put up 6.2% in Miami, which an absolute shithole with uh, Adam Gase there. And then in 2019, he had a 7.7% touchdown rate. So he's shown steady improvement. That's not to say it's going to stay around at 6 to 7% mark, but I don't think he's nearly as bad as many people think he may be because of the poor years he had in Miami. And even though he doesn't have like one of the best weapons groups in the NFL because it doesn't have a lot of depth, the players that he does have in those departments of the field are extremely efficient, whether it's A.J. Brown or John e. Smith or Derrick Henry on his three screen passes a year. Like, he just needs one to two big plays out of those guys per game, which is likely to happen just because of the breakaway speed and how good they are with the ball in their hands. Look at me riled up over here. I low-key, like, threw up in my mouth when I said three screen passes because <laughs> I know it's going to be, like, zero to one this year. But <laughs> the animal you're watching, I know you got hyped up off of that. But I just <laughs> – I think what he showed us last year, he's a very good fantasy quarterback, and he's a decent enough quarterback in real life for me to be able to pull the trigger and have confidence in him as the quarterback 20 and last week he had kind of a tough draw Mike we put up against uh Gardner Minshew and 
I told you, if you put up, if you put Patrick Mahomes up against Gardner Minshew, I'm choosing Gardner Minshew every day of the week. But that's definitely no slight to Ryan Tannehill because I do think that he's basically going the same realm as Gardner Minshew, and he's just a lower volume, higher efficiency version of him. All right, that's it. That's the that's what we got for you guys this week for the upside plays. Massive, massive, huge, huge, huge upside guys that we have for you guys this week. Uh, make sure. Again, the draft guide is live, whether you're playing redraft or dynasty, I'm telling you it's the best resource because it fucking works. I mean, like that's, that's like, I, we get DMS all the time. Like I'm sure you guys do too as well. Like people just DM me their teams and like say like, Hey, like it's my first time playing. Like this is super helpful. And that's honestly why we do it. Hopefully you guys enjoy it. You know, you it's got not the why I do it. Honestly, that shit makes me so angry because their teams are fucking incredible. <laughs> I'm like, yo, like, like some dude will, uh, sent us a home league roster today. And you could see where the picks were. And he had like five RB1s on his team. And it was like, <laughs> Josh Jacobs was the 4-7. I think Joe Mixon was like the 5-4. I'm like, this is this shit pissing me off. So stop buying our fucking draft guide. Fuck you. Fuck you. Yeah. Get the draft guide. Monkey Knife Fight uh, promo. If it. that's available for you, you'll get it for free. Deposit 10 bucks. Play a game. And then you'll get the draft guide. If you're not, if you can't do it through Monkey Knife Fight, I promise you it's worth it anyways. Just, just buy the fucking guide. I'm telling you, it's worth it. And then also... Join up on our Patreon, man. Hop in the Discord. I'm on there. Nick's on there. Noah's on there. But more importantly, leagues are on there. Big dogs leagues. If you're scared of growing a league and having there be no action, I promise you that is not a fear or a reality in the big dog Discord because the trade addicts are everywhere in our Discord. And I promise you, in that first round, the over-under on the number of trades is easily set at three in every single league. So tons of action. A lot of good stuff going on there. Make sure you subscribe to the Bump Bed Breakdowns channel as well as the BDG channel. We got tons of videos uh, coming out there, which uh, Nick has cut from the main channel because it's not good enough. So we're going to put that out on our channel. <laughs> uh, a lot of weekly stuff. We got Market Watch Mondays. That's like my stock report for you guys. We got Five Fact Fridays from Noah. We got the narrative, which we'll record coming up here. We got Q&A this week because it's the second week. We've got just a shitload of content and video for you guys. So you guys are, put, you guys are putting in fucking work over there on your YouTube channel for real. I wish this we're, summer we're, we're wasn't like uh, the right. COVID summer because engagement, you guys would probably be at like 5K subs already by now. Makes me yeah. sad. So that means all <laughs> you guys need to go sub subscribe to them. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, hit us up. Hit all of us up. Follow us on Twitter. Engage with the talk shit with us if you want to. We love that. Just, uh, yeah, man, stay safe out there. Please.